Hi everybody, my name is Carrie Barnum. I am the Executive Director for New Shelves Books, and today we are so excited to have Bob Eckstein here. Bob is a New York Times bestseller, a New Yorker cartoonist, and an NYU adjunct professor, and the world's only snowman expert, which I love. I've seen his book, and it's just so cool. So Bob, thank you so much for being here today. We are so excited to pick your brain and just talk all things illustrations, cartoons, and writing in a pandemic, which is kind of a, a, a whole thing in and of itself. Well, hi, everyone. It's great to be here, Carrie. Um, I have one quick question. Are you going to keep this hair color? Because I just painted you as blonde for the portrait. Well, <clears throat> I like to say I'm a unicorn. My hair color changes. <laughs> uh, it, no, probably not. I always go back to the blonde, but you know, for now. Like I said, it's my quarantine hair. I could have done worse. Yeah. Just shock everyone at the Thanksgiving dinner, then go back. That's, that's my plan, basically. I have to keep things exciting. Well, Bob, I actually, my children ran out to the mailbox at 8 a.m. I don't know why, because our mail doesn't come until after <laughs> 1. But for some reason, they went out and they went to the mailbox and they go, Mom, Mom, you have a package. And I got a book. I was oh, so wow. excited. Your brand new book, The Elements of Stress, um, which I know like just came out, brand spanking new, right? Yeah, and it's just in time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the election's two weeks away, and this is a, supposed to be a humorous handbook, but it really does help people handle the stress that we've all dealt with. Um, mm -hmm. Like I say, things could not get worse, but they can get funnier. Right. <laughs> Which I love because laughter is really all that's taking me through right now. Um, and I love this. And we were just talking about the idea that, especially as writers and authors, um, people are really kind of struggling with being productive. You feel like you're at home, you have time off, you really should be cranking that book out. And then we realize that, uh, no, no, I got a paragraph done and it's horrible and I'm going to trash it. So how have you been dealing with writing in a pandemic? Uh, have you been super productive? Is it just me? Yeah, I have been. And it's always case by case of how people handle stress and how they handle the anxiety of it. But for the most part, I do know that people get really bogged down by the whole uh, you know, anxiousness of, of what's going to happen. The, it's the unknown. It's yeah. the unknown. And what I try to teach in my classes is that you want to embrace the unknown because that's where you find your most creative ideas. Uh, you cannot be creative if you're always anxious because you're afraid to make a mistake. And I, be, I do believe that writers and, and people who are in the arts, they may be creative as a cartoonist or an illustrator or whatever. You don't want to be afraid of making a mistake. You want to be encouraged. It's by accident that you find your best work. Yeah. And so, so during the pandemic, I try to encourage people to say, find a way to block it out find a place that is comfortable for you, um, find ways of, of getting rid of the news cycle so mm -hmm. you can be, let your imagination run and get back to that place where you're not judging yourself. You're not feeling a deadline either. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the illustration I make is that people who have deadlines to finish something, they're not gonna do their best work. The bosses don't realize that they're counterproductive when they force someone to, to do something by a certain time I mean, within reason, of course, depending on the situation. But if you're creative and you have a manuscript that has to be done by a certain time, you're not going to do your best work. You, you need to rushing. allow yourself time. Yeah. Exactly. And you're putting yourself in a state of mind in which you're getting anxious and you're not letting your mind just let it be in a playground. You want to be playful and you want to be in this place in which you're, you're exploring different solutions to problems within your story, your plot, maybe you're developing your character. If you feel like you're just trying to get it over with, you're not gonna create something special. Right, now are you, I know you kind of talked about getting comfortable and different things like that. Like when you work, do you, do you have a special place? Like how do you stay productive? Do you turn off social media? How do you get it done? How do you stay on schedule? Well, I don't procrastinate. I really have to get it done a certain amount of, things in a day. And I have a Trillo board, which uh, we actually shared 
uh, together, a Trillo board that I'm working on. So we'll, we'll show that later in which we have a to-do list. But it's just a question of like getting through all the different things. For instance, I was doing illustrations last night for the Daily Beast until 2.30. Mm -hmm. And then I had to wake up early this morning and I had to send out email. So you say, well, how do you get it done? You just have, you just have to get it done. You just have all these different things. I mean, this summer I did 10 book covers I worked on four books. I mean, just, yeah, there's no time for making excuses. So it sounds like you're kind of like a to-do list person, though, that that's how you kind of stay on track and you use your Trello board for that, which I'm going to share. Yeah. And I, you can, when you say where do you get comfortable, that can be a physical place. And I did create, like, in my backyard spaces to work. I have a, a path that I made from... Um, this great program I took at the Milford Readers and Writers Festival a couple of years ago, where somebody was explaining the importance of having a nature trail that you can go on and you can clear your mind. But yeah. the place to feel comfortable could also be inside your head. It doesn't have to be a physical place. It can be a way that you know that you can get to that place and, and just find yourself back to, it could be a memory that triggers it. It could be just... Um, you know, a to-do list even could be the trick that puts you into that state of mind in which you feel like you're in that place. Right. So it's kind of like centering. For some people, that's meditation. For some people, that's me. I really like to write down my to-do list. I like to write it down because then I'm like, okay, I now know what I have to do and I can see it. I can visualize it and I can kind of visualize, I can get this done. This is realistic. Or I can also say, you know what, I can't get this all done today. What can I move? And by putting myself in that place of uh, control, kind of, it really helps me itemize. And so I've got your Trello board up here, which I love, because yeah. uh, you're a big fan of Trello. So you do your to-do list, but you kind of do it online. That's right. Of course, everyone has their own way of doing it. I mean, whatever works for you, whatever is that motivation, that's great. You could have that to-do list in your head, or you can have a, a person, a friend, a coworker who's giving you that sort of feedback to what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, Carrie, Carrie do, you have a, do you know if you have a time of day in which you're most creative, where you know that you do your best work? Like maybe some people, morning people or late night. I mean, that's important too. Yeah, late night. Well, and I often work late at night. I always, I'll get emails in there like, you should be sleeping. And I'm like, but my house is quiet and I'm so productive. 10 o'clock. 10 to midnight is like my, I, I'm amazed by how much I can get done. And I don't know if that's just because my house is quiet at that time or what, but that is, it always has been. That is when magic happens for me. Uh, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's easy for you to say, you, you know, you have a certain way that works, but I haven't really been able to find a way to do my to-do list. There are tricks and you could trick yourself. One thing I like to say is everyone write for eight minutes a day. Just put aside time and just write for eight minutes and use a timer. You'll always find yourself going past eight minutes. And before you know it, it's an hour or two hours. Mm -hmm. But just make but that point. A yeah. realistic goal to get you started though. Exactly. And also find a place where you say, it's definitely where I want to be is like, have a certain chair or a certain corner in a room. Or maybe mm -hmm. it's a place that you go as a diner or something. But having a regular schedule in which you know is my time to write, my time to get the things done that I said I really want to accomplish and make it a routine. I've always, if you don't have a routine, next thing you know, your wife's handing you the leaf blower. <laughs> I don't do that to my husband, not ever. That's only because you're on the webinar. We have to keep it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my poor husband. He's a saint. Let's just get that out there. He is a saint. So... <laughs> People are asking about your Trello board. So explain to us, do you, it looks like maybe you are collaborating with different people. So can other people see your Trello board? Exactly. That's one of the great advantage of it is that you could team up and you could have people share it and they can also add and subtract to it. And these little boxes could be moved to different columns. This is just one example of the way you can use it. And I just broke it down to the most simple form, in progress, completed, and as I'm working on something, I move it over. And that's because I really believe in the reward system when you do things that you got to feel like 
okay, I did it. You know, I, I moved this over or I'm going to go and have a dessert or I'm going to do something now for myself. Maybe it's getting out and spending time outdoors or something. But I do believe that you need a reward system to feel like you're not doing this for nothing. That You feel like, you know, this is progress. Right. And I like that. And I like that you, I, this is drag and drop, so it's not hard to set up. Um, and for some people, some people really like having, like me, it's writing things down solidifies in my mind. I don't know why. I've tried Trello. I've tried all the things. But for a lot of people, what I like about this, it goes with you everywhere. It's online. You can collaborate with other people. So if you've got a co-writer or if you're, let's say you're a children's book author and you're working with an illustrator, different things like that. Um, you have these options, um, and it's really easy to to put. I like that you have this huge completed list because sometimes I think that's really satisfying too. Of being able to say, I, I told someone yesterday, I said, "Stop shooting yourself," because it was I should have got this done, I should have done that, I should. And I said, "Stop," and let's look at all the things that you have done, and then let's really look at what you can do next. And I think that this really is a nice visual where you can see all of the things that you've really done and accomplished. Um, oh, Ka Carrie, I'm being told that your, your voice went faint for a moment. I know. So if you could uh, I louder raise now? your vol volume. I think so. I'll let everyone else agree with me that I can hear you better. Because mm. usually I'm very loud. We know this. Oh, that's good. Oh, not louder yet, not people are louder. saying. Apparently, I'm just talking too much. We need to listen to Bob more. That's all. I'm using the mute button from yesterday's debate. Uh, that's what it is, which is hilarious. When Bob got on, I said, I can't hear you. And then I realized I had my computer on mute. Still too soft. Hmm. All right, guys, I'm going to go silent for a minute because I'm going to. Oh, no, I think mic. that's no, I think that's good now. Are we better now? I yeah. I feel like a phone commercial. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, good. Oh, Thank wonderful. you, friends, for letting me know. All right, so um, I love that, though. I love that you have your completed list, and you can really see what's going on and and use it. And it's would you say it's fairly easy to set up? Was it? Are you techie? Was it like? A, it's easy. It's easy. It's, easy. Okay. it's it's free. There's different grades. You can go fancy if you wish. Um, and there's a tutorial. And I think that, um, yeah, we covered this. I want people just to dive in and learn from themselves. They'll find that it's very welcoming and uh, very satisfying. And it mm -hmm. may might not be for them, but it's worth trying. And you never know what's going to work for you to get you all of a sudden moving forward. And you got to try these different things. And this is just one thing that I tried after other things didn't quite work. Maybe they were too complicated or whatever. But you have to find that sort of system that works for you and, um, and then bring out the best of, of your work. Yeah, and this is Trello, which is just Trello.com. Um, and I love that you said it's free because I am um, a huge proponent of finding free tools. And sometimes you need upgrades. Like I use Canva, which can be free, but we use it so much that we upgrade. But I love having the options to kind of dive in and then seeing if you need the upgrade. So... Yeah, I want to thank Carol for adding the website to the feed. People could find that the web link is right there. Yes, love it, love it. All right, the next question I actually have is number one, how did you possibly become a snowman expert? Um, it happened when I was walking in through a store trying to decide what books were not there, what book did not exist, and I said to myself, there was no non-denominational books for the holidays aside from cookbooks. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, there's a niche. There's a, there's a void there in the market. Um, I mean, I was always interested in mysteries and stuff, and it could have been a different mystery that I wrote about. I, I've said this over and over, the same joke, which it could have been who made the first joke or who made the first sandwich. Mm -hmm. But I picked Snowmen because it was for the holidays. And also because at the same time, there was other factors. I wanted to take an average everyday object and turn it on its head and find a dark side, like um, you know, the sex and violence in the history of the snowman that does exist. Mm -hmm. And 
they did this with Batman that same year. Batman was a TV show that was very campy. And all of a sudden they came out with this movie starring Buster Keaton that was amazing. And it was a serious and dark movie in a sense compared to the TV show. And I tried to do the same with the snowman book. Um, now I'm showing this, this is a business card and it's how I got an agent. I just simply oh. gave this card at a dinner that I had to an agent, uh, a big agent. And uh, she just from the card said, you know, you're very creative and you have that sort of something. And she took me on as a client. And I, I show this because it shows how there's different ways of getting from point A to B. People mm -hmm. want to know how you get an agent and, and how you go forward. Well, sometimes it's just a clever way or different way of showing that you're an individual voice, that you've got a different voice from someone else, that you do things in a way that they haven't seen before. And this right. card was an example. I love that. And out of the box thinking. I mean, I love that you use that to kind of pitch yourself a little bit. Um, but I could easily see, I love the idea of business cards kind of marketing your book or marketing, you know, so many things. And this is so simple. I mean, very creative, but it's not like, uh, it doesn't have a whole page worth of text on there. You just went simple and let the simplicity speak for itself, which I adore. Yeah, it, there's different ways of doing it. I see people pitch themselves to agents and to publishers. And it's so long that it almost becomes homework for the person receiving that email. I have one quick story is that I was invited to lunch by Simon and Schuster, like the head guy invited me to lunch to consider doing a, a book, the snowman book. This is a long time ago, back in 2007. And before he met with me at the restaurant, I went ahead of time on this December day and I made like eight, big snowmen outside the restaurant so that when he showed up, he would have this crowd of snowmen there greeting him. And this is just another example of trying to think out of the box that makes you rememberable, makes a person remember you in some unique way. And you have to pull all the stops because there's so many talented people out there and there's so many people who are, you know, ready and stuff. So how do you make yourself stand out? And for me, it's always usually a visual something that uh, is simple and less mm -hmm. words. I love that. Now, once you got the deal, uh, I mean, you're an artist. So did you create your own cover or did your publisher create your cover for the snowman book? Well, it's a little presumptuous for you to think that your cover is going to be used, but you yep. do try to, you do try to convince them that you have some input and you have some creative ideas that you think could be helpful. But you have to be very sensitive to their needs. And, and I did learn a lot from that. Do you have the slide in which we show the different? Oh, you know, I have what's... the slide. <laughs> okay, so let me explain. Uh, I'll try to make this quick. But when you do a cover for a book, um, usually you go through like maybe 20 or 30 different covers if it's a major house. Like mm -hmm. I've worked with Penguin Random House and with Simon Schuster. You do about 30 covers. In this case, we had more. It was about 40 different covers. And each cover brought more angst than the last. It was very stressful because I was, the, this was my first book and I was just learning and understanding the needs of what happens. That it's all by committee. That there's many people who need to approve the book. And everyone has a different vision of the book. And I do appreciate now I, hard everyone works and that your book is just one of a zillion books that they, they're dealing with and so i learned was that they really don't know your book as well as you do right so initially they heard history of the snowman they half the group assumed it was a kitty book and so the first attempts of a cover were very sweet and uh, the first cover they showed me was five inches by five inches was this little tiny book oh that's like a yeah that that is a kid's book <laughs> And yeah, they wanted it at the cash register and they said it would be for kids. And then I came back with, you could see a dark cover. Um, mm -hmm. Down here at the bottom, right? Yeah, one of those darker covers, which is like my sensibilities, which is too dark because mm -hmm. then all you would have is these guys who like would buy books about military airplanes and things like that. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. And I was like, yeah, that that's well. a little militant, I think. Exactly. Um, 
it's interesting. There are some interesting covers here, but ultimately what we found out was that um, to appease other, other forces on the outside, uh, namely Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble said they would give a predominant placement if the cover was red. Oh, oh cause Christmas. So just like, well, for whatever reason at that time, their marketing team explained that it was red books doing well. And they said, don't come back to us until you give us a red book. And the original, I mean, the original book, The History of the Snowman that did get published is red. And I don't think it's one of the covers here because I just showed a, a sampling, but there are pages and pages of different covers that were considered. Which, and I it, love this because I think so many people get frustrated or they kind of say, um, well, I have this idea and it, everyone will love it. But the truth is, is that um, it takes a team of people almost because if you had just gone with your idea, it wouldn't have worked. If the publishing house had just gone with what they had originally, it wouldn't have worked. It really takes a collaboration of people who know the market, the author who knows the book, and you really have to learn how to be a team player, which I think is very hard. Learning to be a team player and take input, um, I think is just so important. I know, um, I have broken a few hearts, a few author hearts, when I said, no, that can't go on the cover. I know Shira's on the call, and, uh, and one of my clients and friends, Shira, had a, <laughs> she's saying, yes, you have, because she wanted something on the cover, and I said, oh, that's beautiful. No, and it takes sometimes listening to experts, but you also have to advocate for your own um, your own work and know that you know the story as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I consider myself an expert because I've done, I have done a lot of covers and not just for my own books, but for many other people's books. So I, and I have been in meetings and I understand the needs of people that it's not about what is the best cover. It's not, that, that's not a typo. It's not about what is the best cover. It's about mm -hmm. what is the most memorable cover. What yeah. is the most marketable cover? and the book that people are gonna remember. You have 10 seconds to get people's attention as a glance walking past a pile of books in an enormous store. And you know, there's all these different factors. And I just think that um, you're absolutely right. You have to learn in this business to also understand, be a team player, know when to push, pick your battles. And I will say one thing that's not gonna be a popular answer, but a cover is like one of the most important things about book sales, it really is. You mm -hmm. cannot, I mean, and I can tell immediately when someone does their own cover and hired someone on the side that's a, a cousin yeah. and a person just coming out of art school or something that went through many revisions and rounds at Penguin Random House. You just know, I mean, well, it's just so clear. You can so also clear. tell when the artist of the cover art creates the cover because they are very careful to keep the, the art in Tact, and what you'll notice with a lot of professionally done covers, wording will go over the art. The art is the background, and yes, it matters, but if the artist also designs the cover, very often you will see um, that kind of thing happen where it's it doesn't quite mesh. And people say, don't judge a cover by its book. Guys, we all do. I know I'm not alone. But I'll say it publicly. I judge covers by their books all the time. And most people do, I think. I don't, I think that's just natural. Why would you open up a book if the cover doesn't look great? Yep. So I think that matters for sure. Um, and I love that. So I want to know too, <laughs> curious minds want to know, um, how did you start working with the New Yorker? Like, how did you land that gig? It was just a fluke. Uh, for my snowman book, I wanted to have an intermission, thinking that it was a lot to take in, all this academic stuff. It's all about um, the snowman in the Middle Ages and how it was an early form of political commentary, blah, blah, blah. So I needed a break, and I went to the New Yorker and purchased cartoons for the middle of the book, an intermission. And I became friends with some of the cartoonists one cartoonist in particular, Sam Gross, who's like the greatest living cartoonist, and I became friends. He took me out for my birthday to lunch, to the famous New Yorker lunch that they do weekly. And there I met the different cartoonists. 
at that time, I was not a cartoonist myself. I was an illustrator and I did write humor, but I never did a gag cartoon. So he on a dare said, why don't you try doing cartoons and come mm -hmm. back and I'll introduce you to the New Yorker. And he went the next week and brought me into Bob Mancroft's office, who was the cartoon editor. And it was, um, it was really amazing. He bought the first cartoon that I drew, the first cartoon that I made. Wow. And that's never happened. Many people wait a long time before they make a sale if they do. I didn't realize or appreciate this at the, be at the beginning because everyone there, I assume, was selling cartoons. I didn't realize there were hundreds of people who were not selling. I just thought it was the group of people in person there and that they all made multiple sales. I learned this later that it was beginner's luck. Yeah. And uh, that's how it happened. And it's been on a crazy ride to go that way because I abandoned something that I was more successful at in illustration where the, the gigs were more larger or whatever. But things have changed because back then, like I could do a cover for Sports Illustrated. This is years and years ago they would pay like $25,000 for one cover. But that wow. money doesn't exist. Right now, you can do a cover for the New Yorker. I believe it's like around $1,000. I did, a, I did about 10 magazine covers this summer. I didn't get paid like $25,000. They were all, if I was lucky, four figures. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, the market has changed. But the takeaway of all this is this. You never know where a, a friendship or a new contact is going to lead. I uh, reached out and went to this luncheon. I met these new people and I made friends with them and you never know where it might lead to something else. So you're always, that's like my one skill I think is collecting very talented friends. And you never know when um, it might come into a project where you're doing something together. Mm -hmm. But I think constantly, I mean, this is where I learned from your webinar too. You always preach, get involved in your community, know yeah. your audience. And so I've been trying to do that. And I, I mean, I learn something every day. Every day I work hard, but I always put time to learn something. Listen to podcasts. I, I take screenwriting classes and I, take a, I listen to a podcast called Write Your Own Screenplay. And there's this podcast and other things. And I'm constantly writing down notes. Oh, this is something I should explore. This is something I didn't know. And I truly know that I'm learning more than I'm teaching. I feel like there's so much. Great. Well, and I think that's a really important part, part, bleh, important point. Not only that you have to constantly be connecting with people in your industry, whether it be other authors, illustrators, I mean, we do that all the time, um, but also to constantly be learning. And that does not mean you have to sit down with a book and, you know, like, it's not like that. But podcasts, listening to things, read an article, because that is what keeps you in the game. That is what took you from the Sports Illustrated cover years ago to, you know, doing a cover this summer because you stayed in the game, you stayed up to date because there are a lot of people who kind of get in their way of this is how it's done and then they stop. But then what? What happens is you become a dinosaur. You, you don't keep up with the time. So I think it's so important and so smart that you continue to learn and to grow and we should all do that. Now, I want to mention, I've met you through the magazine Writer's Digest. Mm -hmm. And that magazine teaches me something every issue. It's and, a great magazine. Yeah, I do have a piece coming out in their blog about um, how to handle the pandemic, how to write during these times, and what you can do to try to get yourself back on track and get back to being creative. But um, as, as much as I'm adding stuff to the magazine, I'm taking more away. Right. And well, that's how it should be. That's how a good community works. And I, I love it. So I want to look at a couple of your cartoons, though, because um, not too long ago, Bob sent me one of his books, a newer book. Um, and I sat there and my husband and I, um, my husband and I have been married for 12 years. So we've been married long enough that we can laugh at all of these things. Um, because they're hilarious. I mean, if you've been married any length of time, um, or divorced, or you've never been married. It, it's funny stuff. Um, but I absolutely specifically love all of your illustrations that have to do with writing. Um, this one right here. 
I was rolling. I was absolutely dying. Um, Steve, trust me, this has nothing to do with you being self-published. Um, she's lying, but. Um, <laughs> Don't say that. It, so this kidding. is actually just a sketch. I would have done a, um, a more finished final that was published, but the first story, it starts out as a sketch and I run through different caption ideas and the caption could change. It's just like writing. And it's all about rewriting and going back to it later. And often I do the same technique as I do for my books or, or a piece I'm writing or whatever is sleeping on it and letting it marinate in your mind and coming back to it. And I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent that your subconscious is, is actually working on that piece even when you're sleeping. And that's why when you come back to certain things later, you have a better idea for it. And that's because somehow or another, your mind was letting it sit there and let it, you know, let, let's see if it can grow into something else. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's why we take second looks at our, our works, whether it be a yeah. cartoon, an illustration, or a full manuscript. We kind of need to, I always say, put it down, step away. And then come back later and then read it with fresh eyes. But I love this. I love the humor. Obviously, I'm a huge proponent of people who self-publish and self-publish well. So that was obviously a joke. But also, I just think it's funny. And most people who have self-published or in the publishing or author writing will get the humor. So I love that. And we've got more that, um, again, I think are hilarious. If the Bronte sisters write wrote science fiction um and i think these are so fun i mean do you really how long does it take you to not just come up with it but i know some people are probably thinking oh i could probably do that you know a couple of minutes well i can't draw a stick figure they always end up with too many legs um so how long does it take you to really perfect something like this well, you never know. It can land in your lap. And, you know, this could be from a phone call I had with my agent trying to convince me to change genres. And then you think of, oh, you know, with the Bronte sisters, if they had an agent, would they be writing like young adults instead or something? And you kind of just try to twist things and turn it on its head. And sometimes it could take two or three years before a cartoon that started out as one thing becomes something that at the end is, you know, is just right. And the same thing with a book. I mean, it all applies to all the arts, whether you're telling a joke on stage and doing stand up, which once in a while I've had to do, you know, an hour in front of a group. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a long time, you get the joke right. But you, again, you wait till it um, sits there for a long time. And often the answer is, is how can I simplify this to its core? How do I get to the truth of this joke, this cartoon, mm -hmm. or this book? Have I reached the core of, of the truth of it? And simplify it down in that, in that way. I love that. I often, um, no, not with, with illustrations and graphic design, obviously, but in writing, I so often say, does it need to be there and it's time to cut the fat? If there are extras, if there are extra details or extra is, sometimes we get so excited about our details that we muddy the waters of our story. And it's so important as writers that we, or writers, illustrators, creatives, that we go back and we look at things with fresh eyes and we say, does it add something? Because if it doesn't add something, then it's usually taking something away. So the, the point of simplifying and actually improving something with simplicity is a really important one, I think. Yeah, and Carrie, what you said, I'm so, you know, I feel so strongly about. What I like to tell my writing students is to take their writing with a highlighting pen and highlight, they know their strongest points. Take, out, take put all the sentences that are favorite sentences and highlight them. Now look back at what's not highlighted and decide then, if they needed it. Does it drive the story? Does it really give the characters the want? Or is it really just unnecessary? And it's just, again, slowing down the action. Do everything you can to get to, and it, it applies even to cartoons. I had a cartoon that is a well-known cartoon. It's a, it's a Rubik's Cube cartoon in which someone's hiking up a mountain and the, the guy has a head of a Rubik's Cube 
It's actually on the back of the, of the new book. And it's this cartoon right here. And you can see the guy going up the hill has a messed up Rubik's cube. And the guru at the top of the mountain has a fixed uh, Rubik's cube. Yeah. But this, but this cartoon started with a caption. And it started in a different sense. It was, um, it was a lawyer visiting someone in jail. And but I kept on asking myself, did I get to the core of this? Do I need the captions? Can I do this in the least amount of words and it will give me the most amount of impact and meaning? And this mm-hmm. actually applies to everything you do with the cover. You look at yeah. a cover. Is this the most impactful way? It's not about making it beautiful. It's about, am I saying my message? Am I making it clear that I have an individual voice? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I really so, love that. Um, we have a question coming in about reviews, um, which is a little bit off topic from illustrations, but I know that as an author, you've struggled, everyone does, to push people to review a book. It's easy for people to say, oh, I read your book, I loved it, but to get those reviews, um, what have you found to be the best ways to get people to review your book? Not professional reviews, just you know, general online reviews. Well, I'm, I might not be the right person to ask about this because I don't read reviews and I try to encourage everyone who writes not to read reviews and not to pressure their friends or family to write a review on Amazon. Let it happen naturally and organically. If it happens, great. The main, the main thing is to put the book into everyone's hands and the reviews will come naturally. And, you know, I just feel like uh, don't get caught up in that ego. The ego is your enemy. You do mm-hmm. not want to be worried about what people think. You want to please yourself and know that you're doing your best work. I mean, when I first started, my very first review was a, a full page New York Times book review that was the most negative review you will find in the, in the book review. This woman thought that me writing about snowmen was a ridiculous idea. And it was the chief editor of the Times of the book section. And she hated the book. Hate, hate, hated the book. And you know what? You're not going to please everyone. You just got to keep moving on. And it's easy for me to say because I was upset and we all are going to get to a point to be upset. But to get more reviews, just go on to Goodreads, become part of the community, try to give back love. And you give back compliments, people will bring it back. Yeah, I think I, that's important yeah. is that get in the community, be part of it. Um, and I just had to bring this up because it was too perfect not to. Um, I love this cartoon. I think it's hilarious. I just had someone the other day say, well, if a professional reviewer reviews my book, it, it's going to be nice, right? I said, no. I said, <laughs> if, they, if they decide to review your book, that simply means that they were interested enough to review it. But the review will be based on their own opinions and what they read and all of that so and most of the reviewers even some even some online reviewers they can be tough critics um i don't like goodreads for that reason i find that they are exceptionally um they're a little bit tough because i think they feel like that's their soapbox and no one stands out by being sweet you stand out by really um causing a ruckus (laughs) um well for sure. And so I always say, ask people for reviews, but leave it open-ended. Don't corner people into reviews. Um, that's kind of my take on it, is that it doesn't hurt to ask, but don't pigeonhole people. If you feel like leaving a review, here's the information. I think that's important. And I love what you said about getting the book into people's hands. And that kind of feeds into this question about gifting books. Um, and I think gifting books is just fine. Um, I usually do digital copies rather than um, hardcover, but how do you feel about that, about gifting books for, you know, to get it out there? How many books do you generally send out or give away to people? Well, it's important, and there are people that are on a priority list. I put them in order of, like, who you want to get the book to. Like, I'm going to the post office later, and I'm dropping off about 50 books. Okay. And those are people who are getting the a hard physical copy of the elements of stress for free The people who I kind of knew or met and they've been in touch with me, but I mean, not always people I know well, like I'm sending it to Steve Martin and Sarah Silverman and people like that. Now I, I don't hang out with them, but they've, I've been in touch with them 
And so you take advantage of that, you know, that slight friendship. Mm-hmm. So some people are now thinking, oh boy, I, that's so annoying to hear. And it reminds me of the Morrissey song, uh, you know, we don't want our friends to succeed. So what do you do when you don't happen to have Steve Martin's email address? You start off small and then you, you build on your circle of friends and you'd be surprised. You, you go to book fairs, for instance, and I had a chance at the one book fair at the Milford Readers and Writers Festival, and I ran into Alan Alda. You know, I'm not playing golf with him, but you know, you, you take his email address that you exchange or whatever, and you put it in, and then you do a newsletter, and you just hope that you meet people. And again, it's just, it's just meeting people. I began writing with someone years ago, uh, a writing partner, and he was a host of a uh, NPR comedy hour. And mm-hmm. through him, I had met different people who are famous comedians and stuff. But you know, one thing led to another. So you try to keep organized and you try to keep in touch with people the best you can. And uh, to give out free books, I do believe in gifting books. I give them out to magazines, my editors who I've worked with. That would include for me, like places like Parade Magazine and stuff like that. And most of the time you don't hear back, but every so often you, you do hear back. Like yesterday I heard from LitHub. LitHub.com is a nice. little website. And they're doing a piece about the piece. And, and that's a start. Uh, I sent stuff to, to Reader's Digest. And mm-hmm. they said, nope, this stuff is not right for us. We're sorry. It, it won't work. But it happens and you, for next time. And you always answer them back professionally and very nice. You're grateful. You say, oh, I understand. You don't burn a bridge. And I've seen friends send me an email say, this is what I'm, I told that editor who rejected me. And I said, okay, Jim, do not send that. He goes, please, we'll talk about this. He goes, no, 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 no. I CC'd you on it. I already sent it. <laughs> I mean, well, and also, I hit it all the time. Don't take to Twitter and start writing angry tweets about them either. Um, those things live forever. But I think that's so important too is, and this is hard, and I know that you'll, you'll feel me here, taking not only um, correction or you know feedback, but taking rejection well. Not everyone will resonate with you. Not everyone will like what you do. Um, just be, or... Uh, we could be like, hey, Bob, I think you are awesome. I think you're so cool. I really don't like cartoons. It's just not my thing. Does yeah. it mean that you're going to go to Twitter and start hating on me? Hopefully. I really like your cartoons, Bob. Um, but I mean, I think that it's important to realize that sometimes a rejection of your work is not a rejection of you. And you won't fit everywhere. You should right. Still keep your, you need to be classy. You need to uh, take that as it's meant to be. Either it doesn't work for us or, hey, here's an opportunity for improvement. But I know that's easier to say than to actually do. Right. Now, I just want to clarify something you said, and that is, it might be muddled to people to say, no, I don't read reviews and I don't get upset by reviews, but we're to take criticism and we're supposed to learn from it. There is a difference between people giving you criticism, getting it from the editor or getting it from the publisher, getting it from your agent and getting it from people you trust instead of getting it from on Goodreads from someone called clownfart.com and, and who's a stranger or whoever. I, I just think that you have to, you know, you divide those groups and you don't take it personal. You don't, you Criticism feedback, you don't take personal. You say, how can I improve my book? And yeah. take from what you think is correct, and you could discard. You don't have to be 100% agreement, but you could say, yeah. there's something to learn. There is a takeaway from that, and I'm going to take that bit of information and this, and I'm going to really better my book. Right. Well, and if you're getting the same feedback from different sources – yeah. Pay attention, you guys. I mean, if, if five people who don't know each other are giving you the same feedback, then you need to take another look at it. Um, and I had, Pat is asking, do you include a sales sheet with the gifted book? Yeah. Yes. It's good to have a book sheet. Um, yep. Carrie, you're frozen. Uh, no oh, pun intended. So I'll continue on about the snowman information. Um, a book sheet includes information of a bio. It hopefully has some blurbs. 
A blurb is something no one asks about, but I'm going to just mention that that's something that if you can get, if you can get a blurb, you put it in a book sheet, fold it in a free copy of the book, and you send that out to people who are, you know, uh, possible immediate things. Now, you could do this as a PDF. If you're sending a PDF of your book, you can add a PDF of the book sheet. A book sheet is one page or two pages, and it has your contact information. It has the, um, the specs of the book. People want to know the price point, the, the numbers, you know, the codes or whatever, and all that stuff. Hopefully a picture of the cover so they see that. And that's a great marketing tool. Yeah. Um, I think that, it, exactly, it's got all the basic information. And yours, guys, I think it's important to note, sometimes I really prefer on, um, things I'm sharing online tend to be full color. They tend to have, you know, more things. But this, this sheet right here is totally effective. It was could be printed at home, black and white. It's got yep. the cover of the book, the book information. Um, we've got the the description of the book, and then on the back here are a bunch of the um, endorsements and the reviews yeah. right here for the book. And um, another thing on the bottom is Bob and his co author. Um, so it's important to get the information in there, to have it clearly read. We call this a book, uh, book sheet or a sales sheet. Um, but every, if you have a book, you should have one of these and you should have one for every book that you do. Um, and it's so easy. If you go into a bookstore and you're carrying a copy of your book, it should come with one of these. If you're giving a copy away, it should come with one of these. And one of the things that I think is so important too, Bob, that you've done here, and I don't know how well you guys can see this at home, but it's got all of Bob's contact details. It's not just a, hey, read the book. It's connect with me. It's, it's let's talk and chat. And I think that's really important yeah. as well. Now, a lot of people might be thinking, well, how do you get the blurbs? You know, it's easier said than done. You yeah. know, you got, you got a few years in the business. You had published a book. So, Oh, it's easy for you to say. Well, it just starts off slow with baby steps and you ask nicely to people and often it's, you're asking a stranger and you simply say, I really loved your book. As a matter of fact, it changed my life and I would be honored if you would consider adding a blurb for my book. I didn't know Deepak Chopra, but he wrote a blurb for my uh, a book a couple of books ago and we've become pen pals a little bit of, of sorts since then because you just don't know. And it just goes to show, I mean, to me, the most important thing uh, as a freelancer and as a writer is to just be nice. I mean, that was taught to me early on. Comedians, stand-up comedians used to tell me to get gigs. You want to be nice. Nobody wants to work with someone who's not nice. So it begins with there. And then you become, you know, you nurture friendships and it grows that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I think also when you're reaching out for a blurb or an endorsement, it is so important that you lead with why you're asking. Um, did they impact your life? Do you admire them? Did you read their last book? Give them a reason to, to connect with you. Um, I mean, I could go to Kim Kardashian and be like, hey, Kim, I don't really like you, but you have thousands, millions of followers, so can you endorse my book? probably not going to go over well. <laughs> um, but if you can connect to people, people like connection. We are desperate, especially right now, we're desperate for connection. And I think that when you come from a sincere place of um, admiring someone or the work they do, something like that, but you have to establish that first. People, especially people with big names or who have um, accomplished a lot, they get asked for things all the time, all the time. And so it's important that you appreciate them first before you start asking for things. I think that makes a huge difference. I get an inbox every day of people asking me for blurbs and stuff. And they're not, a lot of them are not nice. They're abrupt. And then when I decline, they even get nastier. Yeah. Well, and people have this expectation of, well, you should, you just should do it. 
Um, no, <laughs> no, I shouldn't. If I do, then, you know, great. But I think that we have to go in with this appreciation of them or their time. Um, and I think that's important. And Linda's asking, does someone have to read your entire book to do a blurb? Um, and the answer is no. Sometimes they will skim. Sometimes they will read parts. Um, sometimes they'll read the whole thing. It just depends on the person and how much, uh, if I'm writing an endorsement for something, I read quite a bit of it because, um, before I put my name on it, I want to know that there's not something random in there where I'm like, oh, they said, they said that? Are you sure they said that? So I think it depends on the person. There are plenty of people who will skim something or they will, um, let's just say it's a good friend. If it's someone that I've worked with for a long time and we're good friends, um, I could probably send them something and say, hey, will you endorse this? And they'll say, sure, what do you want me to say? Um, because they know me and they yeah. trust me. But it just, it's case by case, I think. Bob definitely Linda, would not trust me. He would be reading everything I yes. wrote because he knows me. No, Linda, you, you don't have to even open the book. There's some people who give blurs without reading it. And a lot of people who are well-known and are very busy will ask me to write the blurb, give them choices, and then they pick their favorite one. <clears throat> exactly. Now, you know, but there are a lot of famous people who gave me blurbs to choose from. I mean, I've had some big names and they actually sat, read the book and gave me a choice of like four or five blurbs. So you yeah. don't know. Now, most of the time, a lot of people, unfortunately, have a no blurb policy. So you don't take it personally, but a lot of people will not do blurbs because it has just become too over the top. There's so many people asking for a blurb. Right. Well, or they have, like, I will never, ever write a, re a review or an endorsement of a book I am working with. I have a bias. I'm working with that person, and it would, like, I just can't. And so I think that there are certain reasons within the industry not to, but, I mean, it never hurts to ask. But I think it's also, like you said, sometimes people will, sometimes they won't. Um, in big publishing houses, it's actually really common uh, for the publisher to make use of the other authors in their house. Um, hey, you are repped by this same publisher. You're in the same imprint. So I'm going to send you three books and I really need you to do. You, they kind of lean on their authors that way. And, and people don't realize that's how some of the big, uh, big, publishing houses that's how they get their blurbs and their endorsements is they're in their own house not always yeah. but sometimes so know that it's networking it's it's having it's having people that have people and trying and asking and um and reaching out it's again back to yeah. that community to building it um and people very often i will say this too that people that you support will often want to support you so if you are, if you have been a long-term fan of someone and you've supported them and you've done that, they are more likely to respond favorably to you than if you just go after them because you suddenly need something. Yeah. <clears throat> Carrie, let me add that. I would say asking for blurbs, a 50% success rate is about to be expected. And so people have an expectation. I think people would assume that, you know, every rejection is like, oh, this is terrible. But about 50% would be very, very high. That's, that's yeah. fine. And um, well, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, and that's if you get through to them. Know also that a lot of the people, especially if you're going after big names, uh, the email you find on the internet is not the email they use. <laughs> It's just, it's, it goes through people that, you know, it goes through an assistant or something like that. So I agree. 50% for people you get through to is high. So, but don't give up because sometimes all it takes is one or two and it makes a world of difference. Um, I have another illustration. I know we're kind of at the end, but I know we have some poets on um, and you oh. have. I'm leaving because <laughs> Look, I'm going hey, to be hurting some, breaking some hearts here. Just show them. Is, all right, guys. I know, again, the poetry, but I thought it was funny. But I think everything's funny. Um, this made me laugh, Bob. Your poetry reading nightly in hell. Um, I think it's so funny, too, to pick at things. And I love this about illustrations and cartoons is you can kind of pick at things. But in a, I kind of consider it like friends jibing at each other. Um, 
it's a little friendly back and forth and things like that. And I think it's hilarious. Let's show the other poetry cartoon. Can you get that one? I can. It's right here. Oh, boy. <laughs> Heckler's on Poetry Night. Uh, I love it. I i don't know if anyone kind of got this vibe from me, but I, I'm very sarcastic and I like to heckle people, but only if I like them. If I don't like you, I'm not going to tease you. So if I'm ever just slightly, not mean, but teasing, it's because I like you. Um, and so for those on our chat who are poetry writers and... Um, Forgive me. <laughs> just know that means I like you that I'm showing you this because I think it's hilarious. Hilarious. And this is the first cartoon that I did. And so, this is the first one that you did. Yeah, this is the this is going back to the story we um, were sharing about three hours ago. It was the this is the first cartoon I showed the New Yorker. That is crazy. See, yeah. it, ha it had to have resonated. I can't be the only one. Oh, I just love it. I love again the creativity, the art. Um, the, the, you know, it's just, <laughs> that's hilarious. Our poet, our poet on the line says, you're read to me, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh God. Um, I love Rand it. Randall, I'm sending you free books. <laughs> there you go. Now Bob's got to suck up. I just yeah. love this so much. Well, Bob, I appreciate, I can't say how much I appreciate that you've been on here with us today and, um, Talking about your books again, this is um, Elements of Stress is out, and then we've got All's Fair in Love and War. Um, and so those are your two books that are, you know, up and coming. And where can we find more? Where can we connect with you? More? That's two books coming out in one week. I want, more. I want the snowman books. books. So, so where, can we, where can we find you, though? Well, um, you can go to my website, which is spelled um, B-O-B-E-C-K-S-T-E-I-N. It's spelled Bob Eckstein, and that's a website. And you can follow me on Facebook, and, um, or you can go to elementsofstress.com to order a book. Um, those two books are actually out now. So um, I'm doing promotions for them. I'm doing all these different panels. Like I'm doing a panel in a couple of weeks on the 1,000 books – that you should read before you die. And Ooh. I was asked to do that because um, one of my books is the book that I'm known for is uh, the, the bookstore book. I love and that. What's cool about this, this book opens like a garage door. So to me, that's why it should make the list of important books you should read before you die. And it's got all these different um, illustrations of bookstores. And I've been trying to do a lot of promotion for independent bookstores. And I'll be doing a lot of stories and talks that kind of go back to that, to try to support your independent bookstores and let people know that, you know, they can order books just as easily from their local store. A lot of people think they, they think the local store is only when they're physically going to go shopping in person, but actually they need our help and they need support. And when you do that, it's again, making a relationship. Uh, yeah. This is like an interesting uh, tip is that, with my um, correspondence with bookstores through the years and stuff, I'm able now to email the owner and the buyer of a store and send them a PDF of my new book for them to consider. And that's a great marketing tool. And I, I do understand it's like small steps there to work that way, as opposed to working in the larger form, format of Amazon. But it's all about relationships too. Yeah, well, I, I want to remind everybody of IndieBound.com bookshop. Yes. Um, we have options for indie purchasing. And if you want Bob's books, they are online. But you can also go to your local bookstore and ask for them. And for all of you who are writing books or who have books out, if you want your local store to carry your book, start buying books at your local store. Um, you can't buy all of your books from Amazon and expect that when you go to your local store, they're going to be like, oh, hey, I know you. Let's, let's definitely do this. You have to start the relationship by putting your money where your mouth is, go to your local store, find their website, and purchase an order from them, um, whether it's Bob's book or a different book. Um, I think it's so important that we support local in, in the very 
tangible way of that's where we order and that's where we go through things. So I love that message for sure. Yep. So, all right. Well, Bob, again, thank you so much. And guys, Bob is also in our free advice Friday group. So um, if you, we've got a post in there, if you want to tell him anything you loved about his, uh, his chat here, or ask more questions. I know he's in there and we love that he's part of our community. So thank you all so much. This was an awesome way to kick off the weekend and we will be back next Friday for Free Advice Friday with Amy Collins for Ask an Agent. So more exciting things coming. Go check Bob out and we'll see you next week. Thanks everyone.